Aloha, everyone. I have a question for you today. Are you living in hope? Are you living in hope? And what am I talking about? Well, hi, I'm Brian Ashpole, pastor here at Honolulu Assembly of God, in, here in beautiful Honolulu, <laughs> near world famous Diamond Head. It's Wednesday, October 2nd, and I'm excited, friends. I'm excited because we're looking at incredible scripture passages all this month of October that have the potential to be life changing. That's right, friends. That is right if you apply these powerful truths, you are. They can change your life. And it is powerful, life changing truth comes from Ruth chapters 1 and 2. In the Old Testament, Ruth chapters 1 and 2. So, my question then for you is Are you living in hope? Are you living in hope? And what in the world am I talking about? Well, friends, there are a lot of reasons to not live in hope these days. There's a whole lot of darkness going on in the world. A whole lot of things are happening. We wonder what in the world is going on. There's been the threat of epidemics and sickness and affliction and pandemics, for example, uh, of course, COVID-19. And that has resulted in a lot of financial instability. Or as it's often said, there's too much month at the end of the money. Well, there's also contentious politics going on in our country, a contentious presidential campaign. There's this whole separation of our nation between red and blue states, you know, that, that seems to be uh, very much a great concern. Uh, there uh, are wars and rumors of wars. Jesus explained it in Matthew 24, verse 7 and 8. You know, he predicted this is what was going to happen. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. That's certainly happening in our world. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pain. Uh, verse that's uh, Matthew 24 verse 7 and 8 going on 9 through 14 then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you'll be hated by all nations because of me at that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness the love of most will grow cold but he who stands from the end will be saved she who stands from the end will be saved and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. There, there are a lot of, a whole lot of reasons, I, as I mentioned, to be discouraged, to be disheartened, to be dejected, to be downcast. But Jesus is very clear, John 16, verse 33. In this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have difficulties. You're going to have adversity, opposition, persecution. I mean, he said that 2,000 years ago. That's not just for 2024, though it certainly applies to our time. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. You're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Take heart. Be encouraged. I have overcome the world. So, friends, Jesus Christ is in control. He's in control. He's large and in charge. No matter who is elected president next month, no matter what war is happening around the world, no matter the financial instability that is going on, no matter the uncertainty about the future and what may or may not happen, Jesus Christ is on the throne. He reigns forevermore, friends. He reigns forevermore. And we can live in hope. We can live with hope in him. Now, I ran across an inspirational article recently that I want to share with you. It was written by Dr. Rob Renansky, the pastor, teacher, of Desert Hills Bible Church in Glendale, Arizona. Now, I'm not familiar with Dr. Rob, Pastor Rob Bernanski, but he has shared some things in this article, three lessons from the book of Ruth, the first two chapters, that I would like to pass along to you. And let me start out with a quote from, this is Pastor Rob, Dr. Rob Bernanski. He writes, the book of Ruth shows that even amid a dark period of unthinkable wickedness and rebellion, in other words, think the book of Judges, which is the previous book to Ruth, and, and it, I mean, it's a very dark period, and Ruth is a shining light in that darkness. The book of Ruth shows that even amid a dark period of unthinkable wickedness and rebellion, God is still working to accomplish his purpose of redemption. This book is also a reminder that even when it seems an entire nation has rejected the Lord, his faithful remnant remains. With everything we face in our world today, it is a great relief to look at God's faithful covenant love in the first two chapters of this book. God's covenant love triumphs over everything against his people so that we persevere in hope. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? 
Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? In Ruth chapters 1 and 2, we see a number of these things trying to separate God's people from his love. Yet these chapters are a living illustration of the truth of Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, and God's enduring, unbreakable love for his people. So friends, there are three things from Ruth, the book of Ruth chapters 1 and 2 that enable us to persevere in hope. They enable us to live in hope and enable us to live in the firm foundation of God's covenant love. And, and I'm, I'm going to outline the book. Uh, there's, uh, we don't have time to read all the way through it. It's a powerful passage. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to take time to read it. But that first of those three truths is this, to persevere in hope, to live in hope, friends. We need to recognize the reality of adversity. We need to recognize the reality of adversity. We can't be ignorant about that reality. We, we can't deny it. We can't act as if it doesn't exist. Adversity happens, and it's going to happen. Friends. The story of redemption and Ruth is born in the cradle of adversity. I mean, there wouldn't be a, <laughs> there wouldn't be a story of Ruth without adversity. In just the first chapter, Nomi undergoes five severe trials, five severe adversities. I mean, not just one, but five. You know, you think you might be having some problems? Well, Naomi is experiencing five major crises, one right after the other. So as the story opens, we meet a family of four, Naomi's family, and they're confronted with famine in Israel. This famine was such a severe trial. That's the first, that's the first trial, the first adversity. Then it prompted Elimelech, Naomi's husband, Ruth's future father-in-law, to uproot his family and to move to Moab. Now, this family faces the adversity of living among unfriendly foreigners outside the land that God gave to Israel. That's the second trial. I mean, they must have been desperate to go to Moab. Moab had long opposed Israel. It was the same country whose king, in, you know, in previous books, in uh, Exodus, I believe, uh, uh, Leviticus, one of the, I'm sorry, I didn't look it up. I'll have to check that out. It's the same country as King hired pr the prophet Balaam to curse Israel. You know, there's, there's nothing new today, friends. Israel's neighbors do not want Israel, the nation of Israel, to exist as a nation. I mean, that's been happening for thousands of years. So Naomi finds herself with her family in Moab. And Naomi's third trial occurs when her husband dies. So now she was burdened by being a widow in a foreign land. She's a stranger in a strange land. Naomi's sons, her two sons, eventually marry Moabite women, these foreign women. Then her sons die as well, ending Naomi's family line. That's the fourth trial. She has lost not only her family. I mean, that's, that's a terrible thing, but especially in those days, she's not, lost not only her family, but also any legal help, any protection, any provision from a working husband, working sons. You know, she can't go on Social Security. It didn't exist. So, you know, she's facing a pretty desperate situation. Naomi eventually learns that the Lord has brought the famine to an end, and so she decides to move back home to Bethlehem. It was extremely dangerous for a woman to travel alone, but Naomi's options at this point were to either remain in Moab as an unprotected widow or to take a chance on the journey and hope some distant relative back home in Bethlehem might help her. Both daughters-in-law initially volunteer to leave their own country and go to Israel with Naomi, but she reminds them that she has no sons for them to marry. So one of them decides to stay with her family, stay in Moab, but Ruth is emphatic. She assures Naomi that she will not leave her. When Naomi arrives home back in Bethlehem, the intensity of the adversity she has faced is overwhelming to her. She recognizes the difficulties she has experienced and she has been in her understanding irrevocably changed, you know, because of her trial. Naomi left a woman who was full of joy. She had a husband and sons with a family and high hopes. And she came back impoverished and hopeless. That was her fifth trial, fifth adversity. I mean, she's going through one after the other. It's pretty bad, friends. And the language of this chapter reminds us of the book of Job. Like Job, Naomi loses everything she values in her life. Her trials seem to happen one after right after the other, without a break from the adversity. I mean, it's crushing. She is so <clears throat> overwhelmed by the adversity 
and she faces that she's filled with grief and sorrow. When she goes there, the people say, hey, Naomi's back. And she asks, begs the townspeople to not call her Naomi, which means pleasant, but to call her Mara, which means bitter. Friends, when we're encountering adversity, when we face adversity, remember God is working in and through our lives. Our trials have not taken God by surprise. Can, can you imagine God saying, oh, sorry, missed that problem Ooh, for Naomi. I missed all five. I don't know how that happened. No. No, friends, our trials have not taken God by surprise. Adversity gives the Lord an opportunity to work a miracle in our lives. So, you know, first recognize the reality of adversity. You know, for a miracle to take place, it means re- adversity has to take place first. <coughs> Excuse me, getting a dry throat. Number two, to persevere with hope. To live in hope, we need to respond to adversity in faith. We need to respond to adversity in faith. Now, when Naomi decided to leave Moab, her two daughters-in-law desired to go with her. She encouraged them to return to their home. And eventually, one of them, Orpah, not Oprah, Orpah, was persuaded to go home. But Ruth would not be persuaded. Ruth is determined to follow Naomi wherever she goes, wanting to convert to become an Israelite. In doing so, Ruth understands she must forsake her pagan gods and worship only the true God of Israel. So Ruth freely volunteers her unwavering loyalty to Israel's God. Here we have a foreigner, a Moabite woman, excluded from the Lord's assembly by her nationality. You know, they were the enemy. But she's committing herself to the Lord until death. And what a picture, friends. What a picture. Ruth the Moabitess is utterly loyal to the God of Israel. While Israel itself continually forsakes him. You know, you can read that in the book of Judges. Time after time, Israel has turned their back on the Lord. But in that midst of that dark period, there's this bright light in the book of Ruth. Ruth's conversion certainly appears to be genuine. She does not say Naomi's gods will be her gods. Instead, she specifically names Israel's God. Plus, Boaz later recognized Ruth came to take refuge under the Lord's protection. Through her relationship with Naomi, Ruth saw the futility of the Moabite gods, that they they couldn't make a difference. And she saw the glory of the God of Israel, and she would not be parted from them. What was it about the God of Israel that Ruth found so attractive? Ruth's first exposure to him was a God whose people were suffering from famine. Then her father-in-law died, and her husband and brother-in-law also died. Ruth was a childless widow. She and her mother-in-law were heartbroken and impoverished. But despite all that happened, Ruth wanted to follow the Lord because she had found the truth. She found the truth. Once Ruth recognized the truth, it did not matter the cost or anything else. The God of Israel was the true God. And Ruth clung to him and would not let him go. Ruth responded to adversity with faith. She responded to everything she faced with faith. She did not make her decision based on emotion. She did not make her decision based on external circumstances or anything else. Instead, she made her decision based on God's truth. And friends, that is a great lesson for us today. A great lesson. When we struggle with adversity, does truth drive our response? Does truth drive our response or does our flesh lead us to despair rather than hope? When we tell others the gospel of Jesus Christ, are we confident that the power is in the truth of the gospel, not in our presentation of it? We need to remind ourselves over and over that Scripture is truth. The Word of God is true. We need to remind ourselves over and over that our God is the true God. Against all the world's lies, let's face life's uncertainties. Let's face life's deceptions. Let's face life's adversity. (laughs) Let's face them with faith in God and faith in His Word because His Word is true. That's number two. Number three, to persevere with hope. To live in hope, rest in God's faithfulness throughout adversity. Number two, you put your faith in Him. And number three, you you rest in His faithfulness. Chapter two of Ruth shows God's faithfulness to Ruth and Naomi. For example, when Ruth settles in her new home, she takes the initiative to go and find food. Hey, I'm going to go out and glean. You know, work in in the fields. The field that Ruth discovers to glean in belongs to a man named Boaz who was related to Naomi's late husband. Sounds like coincidence. It's not. God's directing and orchestrating everything that's going on. 
When Boaz finds Ruth's identity, he instructs his workers to make sure she is provided for, she is protected. Ruth also, excuse me, Boaz also tells Ruth he has provided for her because of her godly reputation. In the end, God's provision for Naomi and Ruth is more than abundant, friends. It's more than abundant, not only of food, but also of physical protection, something two widows would have severely needed in their, their culture and in their time period. Moreover, it appears that a budding romance is beginning between Boaz and Ruth. And that's in uh, chapter 3 and 4, and that's a great story for another day. As we look at this chapter, Ruth chapter 2, God's provision for Naomi and Ruth is unmistakable. Friends, it's unmistakable. God provides for the ladies in their distress in more ways than initially Ruth and Naomi could even imagine. And this is how God works. He regularly provides for his people even during adversity. We can rest in his care and love even if the entire world around us has been turned upside down. And often that's what it seems like it's happening. Friends, but don't look to the circumstances. Look to the Lord. Put your faith and trust in him because he is faithful. Pastor Rob Bernanski has a closing word. He says, here we see two women who were able to persevere in hope because of God's faithfulness. Without God, they would have had no hope, and neither does anyone apart from faith in Christ. It's amazing to consider that Ruth was part of a population that God said was never allowed in his people, and yet Ruth was received by God because she trusted in him. Jesus turns away no one who comes to him in faith. What a marvelous and reassuring promise of hope and salvation. Oh, friends, what a glorious truth. Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your current circumstances is. It doesn't matter anything else. Call upon the Lord for salvation. Look to him in the midst of your trials and tribulations, no matter what's going on. He's in control. And uh, when you put your faith and trust in him, you'll find he will demonstrate his faithfulness to you. Isn't that beautiful, friends? That is powerful. That can change your life. Are you living in hope? Are you living in hope? To live in hope, number one, we need to recognize the reality of adversity. Yeah, it's there. We're not naive to it or ignorant of it. Number two, we need to respond to adversity in faith. So we see the adversity, but we respond not living in confusion and fear and doubt, but in faith. And then number three, we need to rest in God's faithfulness in the midst of that adversity. No matter what's happening, God's in control. Naomi forgot that for a moment in chapter 1. But then in the end, she rejoices knowing that God was in control all along. Friends, we need to live in hope. We need to have a firm foundation. We need to build on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. In the Bible, the phrase solid rock is a metaphor, a word picture for the unwavering strength and re reliability of Jesus Christ. He's the one who serves as the foundation for a Christian's faith. And that reminds me of the story of Edward Mo. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Try to throw it today. And this story comes from hymncharts.com. <coughs> it goes like this. From the unruly streets of London to the pulpits of Baptist churches, Edward Moat's life was a testament to the transformative power of God's grace. Born in 1797 to pub-owning parents, young Edward grew up without any knowledge of the Bible or the loving presence of Christ. As he later recalled, quote, so ignorant was I that I did not know there was a God, unquote. But God had a plan for Edward Moat. As a young apprentice cabinet maker, Moat's life took a pivotal turn when his master brought him to the Tottenham Court Road Chapel. There, under the passionate preaching of John Hyatt, Moat encountered Jesus Christ and embraced him as a savior. He embraced Christ as a savior. This experience would forever change the course of his life. Despite his newfound faith, Moat continued to work diligently as a cabinet maker, eventually establishing his own successful business. However, his heart was now filled with a deep love for hymns and a desire to express his gratitude to God through music. One fateful morning in 1834, as Moat walked to his workshop in Holborn, London, the words of a chorus came to his mind, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
By the end of the day, Mode had penned four verses of what would become one of the most beloved hymns of all time. The following Sunday, Mote visited a friend whose wife lay ill. As they gathered to sing a hymn and pray together, Mote realized he had forgotten his hymnal. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out the verses he had written just days before. The words brought comfort and solace to the ailing woman. And Mote, moved by the impact of his composition, added two more stanzas and had 1,000 copies printed to share with others. In 1836, Mote's hymn, now titled The Solid Rock, was published in the groundbreaking collection Hymns of Praise, a new selection of gospel hymns, the first known use of the term gospel hymn. The song's powerful message, rooted in the parable of the wise and foolish builders, and that's found in Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27, resonated with congregations far and wide. You can find it in hymn number 16 in our Sing His Praise a hymnal that we use at uh, Honolulu Assembly. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Verse 2, when darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds within the veil. Verse 3, his oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and stay. And then verse 4, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground. The sinking sand. Isn't that beautiful, friend? That can change your life. Is Jesus Christ in charge of your life? That's my question for you right now. Is Jesus Christ in charge of your life? Is he your Savior and Lord? Is he your Redeemer? Have you surrendered your life completely to him? I want to challenge you, friend. Repent of your sins. Declare Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord. Put all your trust in him. That's the place we get. And do it today, friend. Do it today. Don't wait till tomorrow or next week or next month. Do it today and live in hope. Live in hope, friends. Maybe you've done that. Maybe in response to what I've shared with you today, please leave me a comment. I really want to hear from you. Friends, please let me know how you're doing. Wherever you are, wherever you're watching, please leave me a message. Maybe it's our website, honoluluag.org. Honoluluag.org, where the invitation is come as you are. Everyone is welcome because no one is perfect, but through Jesus Christ, anything is possible. And we're a group of imperfect people that gather every week to worship a perfect God. We'd love to have you join us, even this Sunday. Or maybe it's our Facebook page. We've had a number of people checking out these Bible studies recent Wednesdays. Uh, well, not the last couple of weeks, but before that. But And if that's you, thank you very much. If you haven't gotten there yet, you're on Facebook, just search for Honolulu AG. Or maybe you're not on social media, and that's okay. Our YouTube channel will be a lot more convenient for you. YouTube, very easy to find. Just go there, search for Honolulu Assembly of God. And when you get there, would you give us a like or subscribe, whichever is appropriate. And please, friends, please share our website or Facebook or YouTube resource with others so they can be encouraged also. If you've been blessed today, you've been encouraged, if you've been inspired, would you share that with someone else? Pass it along to someone else so they can be encouraged and inspired also. We're going to pray in just a moment. Let me share one more thing I'm excited about as I am every week, and that's this Sunday, October 6th. We're going to continue our new study series through the first and second Thessalonians in the New Testament title, Live Ready. Live Ready. I love that title, that, that series title. This Sunday, it's about a loving friend. That's Paul writing about his love for the believers in Thessalonica, first Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 17 through chapter 3, verse 17. 13. So please invite someone to join you this Sunday morning at 10.35 a.m., either in the building, in the Kaimuki area of Honolulu, near world-famous Diamond Head, as I mentioned, just east of world-famous Waikiki Beach. Please join us in person, or if you can't join us in person, please join us online for a live broadcast on either Facebook or our YouTube channel. We live stream every Sunday morning at 10.35 a.m. to both locations. We'd love to have you join us. This Saturday, by the way, October 5th, we're going to have a drive through prayer outreach in our parking lot. If you like, if you live on Oahu and like to have prayer, just drive your car to our parking lot. 
between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., we'll gather around you and pray for you. It's wonderful to see what the Lord does each week. Well, speaking of prayer, are you ready to go to the Lord in prayer? Let's go to him. Let's do it. Dear Lord, I depend upon you each and every day. Lord, I don't want to live in fear or, or doubt or worry or distress, be in distress. Lord, I want to live in hope. Lord, because you're on, you're on the throne and you reign forevermore. You are large and in charge. You're in control. And so I want to honor you with everything I say and do. I want to surrender everything. I am and everything I have to you, Lord, that you might be glorified and exalted. And I put all my faith and trust in you. Help me to continue to do that, Lord. I pray that not only for myself, but I pray that for everyone watching, every man, every woman, every young person, every boy, every girl. May they look to you and be saved, Lord. May they repent of their sin, declare you as your Savior. Their lives be transformed. And may they live in hope, Lord, knowing that you're in control, that assurance, knowing that you are on the throne and you reign forever and ever. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Friends, God bless you. Jesus loves you. Aloha, aloha, can't cook. God loves you. God is love. Well, there's more life change truth coming up right here, right where you're watching. So I look forward to being with you again next time. Until then, God bless. Aloha. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.